So today's topic is star lifting, a way of removing mass directly from a star, like our sun. I've talked about star lifting from time to time in the past, but never in a detailed way, so we will explore it in depth today. How you would do this, and why you would do this, are our primary goals for today, though we are going to cover them backwards by asking why you want to do this, then discussing the various methods. I should add that if you are new to this channel, that this probably is not the best episode to begin with. It is loosely tied into the Megastructure series, so while you do not need to have watched those first, it will help. And you may want to watch them and come back, or watch them afterwards, particularly Episodes 4, 5, and 8. Before we jump into how we gather matter from Alpha Star, let's talk about why you would do this. There's basically seven reasons. Number 1, to get hydrogen from the star. Number 2, to get the other elements from that star. Number 3, to make heavier elements via transmutation. Number 4, to extend the lifetime of a star. Number 5, to decrease the brightness of a star. Number 6, to make new stars. Number 7, to prevent a larger star from exploding. Now many of those overlap of course, but they form your motivations for doing this, and it is a time and effort intensive process, so you need good motivations. I joked in the teaser for this episode last week that it is how you destroy a star, which is true enough, but it is like destroying a star the same way you destroy a mountain by mining it. Destruction is not your real objective. Stars are mostly made up of hydrogen, the most abundant type of normal matter in the universe. They convert that into helium to produce energy by nuclear fusion. In the larger stars, as their cores get depleted of hydrogen and they begin burning helium, they can also produce heavier elements too. Now if we have working nuclear fusion, especially fusion that can, like a star, turn normal hydrogen into helium, then stars are handy places to find hydrogen to fuel your fusion reactors. But the Sun is not the best place to mine for hydrogen, since Jupiter has tons of it and is easier to get it from if you already have fusion to power all your extraction efforts. Jupiter is big, but not as big as the Sun, so the gravity is less and it is not as hard to get the hydrogen away from it. Of course it is not as big so it does not have nearly as much hydrogen and if you run out you have to turn to the Sun. In fact, you would probably start with the smaller gas giants like Saturn to begin with for the same reason. Saturn has less gravity, so it is less effort getting the stuff. Now even without fusion, hydrogen has three very good uses. First, it is incredibly plentiful, so makes a nice source of mass when you are building things like the shell worlds we discussed in Megastructures Episode 5. When you need mass, hydrogen is pretty handy. Second. It is actually one of the best radiation shields you can get. It is not only plentiful and useless for normal construction, but is great for stopping high energy radiation. As such, it makes a nice shielding layer around things like the rotating habitats we discussed in Megastructures Episode 4. Being both cheap and plentiful, you can shield space stations from collisions, radiation, and attack by having thin-walled tanks of hydrogen surrounding your structure like armor. If you are powering that with fusion reactors, it also makes a good place to store your fuel. Third, hydrogen is plentiful in the Universe, but in the inner solar system it is quite uncommon, with the obvious exception of the Sun itself, and oxygen, the third most abundant substance in the Universe, is the most common substance in the inner solar system, and those two make water which is important for life. So if you want lots of water, just about all of it is on Earth and you will need a lot of hydrogen to make it. Those are the most obvious uses for hydrogen itself, besides making new stars which we will get to in a bit. But it is easy for folks to forget that hydrogen and helium are not the only things in the Sun, and we call everything but these two metals. A star's metallicity is a measure of everything else in it besides hydrogen and helium, even though very little of that is what we would normally call metals. We actually break stars into three categories, Population 1, 2, and 3 based on how much metal they have in them. The very oldest stars, the ones still alive from back near the beginning of things, or in distant galaxies where we can see back in time to the early Universe, are Population 3 stars and have virtually no metals. 
Newer stars have more because when old stars explode and release metals, it tends to get just as many of those in the stars as the planets get. Population 2 stars are considered metal poor, and they are a bit hotter and bluer than Population 1 stars, metal rich stars, since they can run a bit hotter without those metals interfering with fusion. Population 2 and 3 stars are not considered great candidates for having nice rocky planets like Earth since the emerging solar system would not have had many metals to form rocky planets from. Our Sun is defined as Population 1, metal rich, which means it has a bit less than 2% of its mass from stuff besides hydrogen and helium, most of which is oxygen. A bit less than 2% might not sound like much, but it means the Sun has more of these metals than the rest of the solar system combined since even Jupiter, which outmasses the rest of the solar system combined itself by a large margin, only masses a thousandth of what the Sun does, and it is mostly hydrogen and helium too. Meaning the Sun has something like 20 times Jupiter's total mass, or 6 or 7 thousand times the Earth's mass, in these metals. You might think the denser materials would all be packed up in the core of the Sun, but they tend to be fairly well distributed throughout. The Sun is quite convective and the contents mix around like a bubbling soup. So if you lift matter off the Sun you will get plenty of these metals too. Most is oxygen, and the biggest chunk of the remainder is carbon followed by nitrogen, and those are the three biggest consumers of mass when you are trying to make artificial space habitats and planets. Whenever I am talking about Dyson Spheres, which is technically almost never since I am usually talking about Dyson Swarms instead, I get asked by some where you would come up with all the mass to build one of the spheres or swarms. Now as I have mentioned in the past, there is more than enough material in the planet Mercury alone to build a swarm of thin power collectors around the Sun. But if you need a lot of mass so you can build more substantial structures, the Sun is a great source in and of itself. If you extracted all those elements besides hydrogen and helium from the Sun, you would have a couple thousand times more of them than you would from disassembling all the rocky inner planets and asteroids combined. If we were envisioning trying to build a classic Dyson shell around the Sun out at Earth's distance, this would be a poor surface of around 3 times 10 to the 23rd square meters. If you only use Earth's mass this would only give you about 20 kilograms per square meter, again more than enough for solar panels around the Sun but not much to live on. Yank all that metal out of the Sun and this becomes a much more robust figure of about 100 tons a square meter, which is definitely a comfortable amount of material to be building human habitats out of. You have everything you need to make rock and water and air out of. Of course if that is not enough, we still have the option of transmutation. Heavier elements are made by nuclear fusion. Hydrogen turns into helium that turns into carbon, oxygen, and so on. So hypothetically you can turn hydrogen into, say, iron, with some steps in between, and actually gain energy from doing this. We have not yet mastered the easiest type of fusion, which is hydrogen's isotopes deuterium and tritium, but if we manage to get this unlocked we might be able to do plain vanilla hydrogen fusion too, and learn to turn helium into carbon, which is even harder, and possibly all the higher ones. It is all about getting a high enough temperature and pressure in your reactor, and if you can do that you can not only make those higher elements in a reactor, but get a net positive amount of energy out of it two boards with one stone. This is obviously preferred if you can do it, since you can not only yank hydrogen and helium off your Sun and turn them into whatever you want, but also gain power from it. But right now, we can make these things by slamming lighter nuclei together in a super collider. That costs power, quite a lot of it, but if you need heavier matter because you don't have enough of it, and most of your Dyson Swarm consists of power collectors, not artificial habitats, you can use all that extra power from the Sun to scoop hydrogen and helium up from the Sun and run it around a giant super collider also powered by the Sun. As you do this, you will also be decreasing the mass of the Sun and so also decreasing its power output. But that is actually a good thing since if the Sun is getting dimmer while you are making more matter to build stuff around it, 
you will also need less and less metal to absorb all that light, since there is less of it, and you just keep going until you reach a happy medium. You make your star lighter and lighter, and dimmer and dimmer, making material to encompass that star until you have what you need to encompass that newer, dimmer star that doesn't need as much mass to encompass it anymore. So it really doesn't matter how inefficient this process is, but again the fusion of matter into heavier elements produces energy, so there's a very good chance you could run this operation at a profit rather than having to dump tons of energy down the drain for transmutation. But if that's your only option, it is still doable. Of course that is not the only reason to decrease a star's mass. Stars get dimmer as they lose mass, quite a lot dimmer too. A star twice as massive as our Sun is not twice as bright, they are about 16 times brighter, while one half as massive as us is about 1 16th as bright. Because of this, even though bigger stars have more fuel, they do not live nearly as long, less than you would think since they tend to explode long before they use up all their hydrogen. Smaller stars use a lot more of their hydrogen and they use it a lot slower, so they live a lot longer. Our Sun is about halfway through its life of about 10 billion years, ones twice as big live a bit under 2 billion years while one half our size would live more like 60 billion years. So we could extend our Sun's lifetime by removing some of its mass, more than you might expect since by decreasing that mass we let it stir around its contents more to make it keep going longer with less helium in the core, killing the current hydrogen fusion process. Indeed, you could constantly star lift, removing the helium and other elements and dumping the hydrogen back down, and even adding more hydrogen from other sources to potentially extend that star's lifetime indefinitely so long as you have hydrogen to keep adding. And again, smaller stars churn their contents up more, so decreasing a star's mass makes it easier to remove the helium which could be thought of as a poison or toxin that kills stars. Also, again, smaller star, dimmer star, less material needed to make use of the light it does put off. Yank just 10% of our Sun's mass off and it would be about two-thirds as bright as now, needing only two-thirds the material to construct a Dyson Swarm, and you will have about 30,000 times the mass of Earth in matter to play with. Of course, what you do with all that removed hydrogen and helium is another story, so is capturing it when it comes off the Sun which we will talk about when we discuss how you actually do star lifting in a couple minutes. You have the option of making another smaller sun out of it, and again smaller suns are a lot better at converting hydrogen to helium without exploding before they finish. It is generally thought that stars under about a quarter of the mass of our own sun, smaller red dwarf stars, do not even become red giants as other stars do near the end of their life, but just turn into blue dwarf stars instead. Not expanding, just getting hotter and turning into white dwarf stars at the end. We cannot be sure since no star in the universe of that mass has been around long enough to do this, but these are the type of red dwarf stars that are thought to be able to live over a trillion years. The ones a bit more massive live a lot longer than our Sun, but still go red giant at some point before they go through all their hydrogen, so they live significantly shorter lives than these. Most stars in the universe are red dwarf stars, and we are talking about maybe turning our own Sun into one by star lifting. So let me remind everyone that the color of stars is a bit of a misnomer, they all give off white light. The spectrum is a bit different, but even the dimmest and coldest red dwarf would give a light similar to an incandescent light bulb. I have heard people object to the idea of settling wards around a red dwarf star because they would not want to live under red light. Besides this being, presumably, much better than not being alive at all, I mean I would rather live in the tundra than not at all. It is also wrong since the light would be about the same as what you are used to. If you really wanted that hotter, wider light, you could just make blue dwarf stars from the outset by using a mixture of hydrogen and helium anyway if you are in the star making game. Gives you something to do with all that helium I suppose. But speaking of dying stars and red giants brings up our last use of star lifting, which is preventing the bigger ones from exploding. 
Now I mentioned back in the Shikata Thrusters episode, which dealt with moving stars, that it is easier to move bigger ones than smaller ones. The result of which is that if you have a giant star getting ready to go supernova, it is easier to move it away from your own solar system than to move your solar system. A better option anyway since you probably colonized many solar systems in that area, so it is better to give the boot to the single big problem child in your neighborhood than to move all the other colonized solar systems. But star lifting offers us an alternative to that. You get in there and instead of using the star's light to push it away, you use that light to power star lifting and strip mass off the star before it can explode violently. And while supernovae are our main source of metals, that is not an efficient process anyway, so you would probably be better off using the super collider approach even if you have not got some easier method of transmutation available. Okay, so lastly, how do we actually do this? As I mentioned, there are multiple methods, but there are three key ones that usually get discussed and I will limit us to those, with the exception of mentioning the most simple and obvious, which is just flying down there and scooping the matter up and flying away. They did that in the TV show Stargate Universe, and it was probably my favorite scene in that sadly short-lived spin-off of my favorite science fiction franchise. This is not going to be a practical approach unless you have all sorts of awesome technology we do not have. It is also generally called sun scooping, not star lifting, though it is both. When you start talking about harvesting stars for their matter, people tend to assume only very high technology civilizations could do such things. Some of us call that Clark Tech, as a hat tip to Arthur C. Clark and his quote about any sufficiently advanced technology being indistinguishable from magic. The methods we will be talking about are not high tech at all. Much like Dyson Swarms, while people think of them as super high tech, as Clark Tech, they can be done with just raw, brute force. You do not need much technology. All three of these methods we are about to discuss were thought up, to the best of my knowledge, by David Criswell who was also assumed to have coined the term star lifting. They are 1. Thermal Driven Outflow, 2. Centrifugal Acceleration, and 3. The Huff and Puff Method. <laughs> I always get a kick out of the name for the last one. Okay, the first Thermal Driven Outflow, which I would just call TDO star lifting henceforth, or TDO, basically works by heating up bits of a star's atmosphere. You can do this by beaming down microwaves powered by solar panels, or even just reflecting light back down focused on a spot with big mirrors. Those mirrors could hover over the same spot instead of orbiting, using the statite method we have discussed in the past. This would kick up an eruption much like a solar flare, feeding more solar wind. You would then have a giant ring around the Sun, sucking up sunlight and generating a big ring of current as well as a huge, toroidal magnetic field. This would tend to pump this matter up and down out the pores of the Sun, which is handy since we live around the equator. Incidentally, you could do this on the Sun right now to collect the normal solar wind, but all Sun's solar wind does not give off that much matter. Bigger stars give off tons that way, but for our Sun, you have to be blasting spots to cause eruptions to get that much solar wind. Now the capture method for this stuff as it heads up from the pole is to use giant magnetic rocket nozzles. Magnetic nozzles are a concept that's been discussed for use in the Vasmir Thruster, which we discussed along with some other propulsion methods a couple episodes back. This lets you use magnetic fields to direct plasma rather than having it flow through a classic metal nozzle which would get kind of hot. It also cools the plasma slightly, making it easier to collect. Two quick notes. First, the ring around the Sun does not have to be a solid object. It can just be a bunch of orbital stations. They can just shoot streams of charged ions between each other to make that ring of current. Each station is a particle accelerator, presumably powered by sunlight. But you could use a solid one and it would not fly apart or anything. It is not a Niven-style ring ward under huge centrifugal force. Though we discussed making giant stationary rings back in the first episode of the Megastructure series if you want one. A solid one is maybe more useful if you want to have a massive collection of super colliders for transmutation of elements. Second, the nozzles are probably way too dense to work as statites, unlike mirrors which can just hover over the sun bouncing light back down. And they need to stay over the poles. 
so if you are wondering how they would, just remember they are called giant magnetic rocket nozzles for a reason. They can keep themselves from falling down by sucking all that matter flying off the star at high speeds. Giant plasma thrusters. Notice by the way that TDO starlifting is not particularly high tech, and I want to emphasize that. Okay, method 2. Centrifugal acceleration or CA starlifting. This is a lot like TDO starlifting, but you put your ring around the poles instead, and your nozzles around the equator. You then rotate your rings a lot faster than the star rotates, and you rotate it around the star's poles, and it starts flinging matter outward. This is much harder, since you have to keep pushing on that ring to keep it spinning, but as I understand it, this is supposed to create a much faster outflow of matter, albeit sprayed all over the place. So I think this would be the sort of thing you would do if your main goal was not harvesting the star for matter, but just lightening it in a hoy. TDO is better, or at least simpler. Okay, method 3, Huff and Puff, which I guess we could call H&P starlifting. Huff and Puff sounds cooler though, but the actual effect is more like a bellows. Here your ring of particle accelerators are not staying up by orbiting the sun, but magnetically floating over it, akin to the electrodynamic tethering method we discussed in the Spaceship Propulsion Compendium, but it is the ring current they are generating that is holding them up. You then shut the ring current off and let the stations begin to fall. Once they pick up a lot of speed, you snap the ring current back on and they begin flying back up away from the sun, rinse and repeat. Doing this generates a squeezing action on the sun, pumping the sun's atmosphere up through the poles, again to be caught by the magnetic rocket nozzles. If you are only using one ring to do this, you would get that beating pulse or bellows effect on the polar matter stream, but you could have several rings doing this at once in a well-timed pumping action for a bigger and more steady outflow of matter. Personally this is the one I like the most, partially for the name, and it should be faster than TDO which is a much more passive process. Okay, some notes on starlifting. Removing matter from the sun costs about 200 billion joules per kilogram, and that's the minimum if you are doing it with 100% efficiency. That's a thousand times what it is to get off Earth, so do not think this is an easy process. That said, while it costs a couple hundred billion joules of energy to yank a kilogram of matter off the sun, fusing a kilogram of hydrogen into helium gets you more than a thousand times that much energy, so even if you are not doing it too efficiently, the sun provides a lot more power from fusion than is needed to take the sun apart. If you use the sun's entire energy output at 100% lifting efficiency, you could remove about an Earth's worth of mass this way every century and take apart the Sun in about 30 million years. Realistically, even getting 10% efficiency would be very impressive, and you would not be using all the Sun's light for this, so think of this as a very slow process. Not that the more optimistic 30 million years is exactly fast. Giant stars have more binding energy, but are a lot less dense. They're much bigger than their mass would indicate, especially red giants which are often as big as a Dyson Sphere but only as massive as their own sun. They are also way brighter, giving you way more power to work with, so you can pull one apart a lot faster. I would not want to go racing off trying to prevent a supergiant star that just transitioned into a red supergiant and trying to suck the mass off it before it went supernova. They usually only spend 1 or 2 million years in that state, but you probably could do it. Needless to say, getting there when they are younger is a smarter idea. But that is one of the reasons why I tell people that interstellar civilizations do not need to worry about a supernova wiping them out. A supernova is not a particularly big threat to a K2 civilization, let alone a bigger one, and anyone engaging in starlifting is almost by definition a K2 civilization, or very close to it. Speaking of which, in two weeks we will be discussing a lot of the other cool things a K2 civilization, or Kardashev 2 civilization, can do in an episode on the Kardashev scale. We have talked about that before, but always in passing and usually just one cool thing they can do. That topic got picked by the Facebook group, Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur, 
and we always have a poll going on over there to pick topics for the channel, so head on over and join and vote. This week's video was selected as our topic by our Patreon group, the winner being Bill Maines, and I wanted to thank him for selecting this topic and helping me plan out the material. We also have our third and final topic winner, Neo Navis, who has selected stars as our topic, which we will do sometime in November. We still need to flush out what will be covered, but I will be demystifying a lot of the astronomical terms and also discussing a lot of the weird hypothetical stars like quark stars or dark matter stars. These Patreon picks have been a lot of fun to do, so I will probably continue this with a modification in the future. I'll put those details out when I decide the best way to do that. Next week's topic however is cryptocurrency and blockchain, and we will be looking at these concepts and contemplating how they might be useful in related areas or for things like interstellar commerce, where it might take years to confirm someone's bank account balance if they are visiting from another solar system. So again, next week is cryptocurrency. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you want to alerts when that and future videos come out. And in the meantime, you can try out some of the other episodes on the channel. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to like it and share it with others. Until next week, thanks for watching and have a great day.